compliment. I'm happy to introduce our, for the last time, to introduce our native speaker on campus, Brooks Rexroad, who is our visiting professor through the Fulbright program. And today he's going to give us a wonderful, his wonderful lecture, America's Siberian Introduction to the Rust Bill. And uh, the time, uh, the schedule of the, uh, the timing of the lecture is approximately one hour, and after that we're going to take questions, right? So if you have any questions, problems during the lecture, you're welcome to raise your hand or ask later, right? So, okay. oh, hello, come in. So thank you for, uh, for joining us today. You're welcome. All right. Hey, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, um, uh, I, I, uh, that's hard to listen to, the, the introduction for the last time. I feel a little bit like I'm dying <laughs> that I'm being introduced for the last time. Um, but it is, uh, it's, it's kind of an, an emotional week. I, I leave actually uh, one week from today, and so it's been an amazing year, and uh, I've been excited to, to be here on campus and in the community um, for the last year, and uh, I'm really glad to, to be able to talk to you a little bit today uh, about my home. Um, and one of the things that immediately struck me when I arrived in Novosibirsk was how familiar it felt. And it felt familiar for a, for a few simple reasons. First, you know, I, I got here and, and one of the things that I really love is, is coffee and, and there's a wonderful culture of, of coffee here. Um, which might sound like a really trite thing, um, but I, I think just globally and historically the thing that happens around coffee is community and um, uh, the coffee shop or even the tea house is, is a place historically and traditionally where people get together, they exchange ideas, they do work, um, they interact with each other and socialize. And so um, finding a, a big culture that's, that's focused on those things here um, made me really comfortable. But the comfort started to extend beyond that because the region began to feel very um, familiar to me uh, for a lot of reasons. Um, my home region is, uh, is called the Rust Belt. Um, it's not a very wonderful sounding name. We'll talk in a little bit about how it got that name um, and, and sort of that unflattering name and how the name has actually changed um, in, in its feeling and tone over the years and how that name has sort of been reclaimed into a prideful thing rather than a disparaging one. Um, but the name of my home region and the name of Siberia was, was one of the first similarities that I sort of felt because these are, these are names that the rest of the world outside of that community hears and they instantly think of negative things. When people around the world think of Siberia, they think of two things, cold and oppression. Those are the two things that, that come to most people's minds when they think of this place. And uh, I, I can tell you very plainly and very clearly, it took me about three hours here to realize that that, that was not the heart of this region. And I, I think intellectually I knew that before I arrived, but simply um, landing and seeing this place, those were, those were not the two things that, that are relevant to this area uh, right now. Certainly cold is accurate, but it's not all of what this area comprises. Uh, in the same way, the rest of the world hears about my home region. They hear about um, cities like Detroit that have, have failed and have struggled uh, and have had uh, hard times. And so they think of the Rust Belt and they think of failure, they think of decay, they think of broken down buildings and failed industry. Um, but there's a lot more going on in those regions. There's a lot more going on in the cities, the towns, the communities. There's, there's um, complexity to the people, complexity to the climate and the environment. Um, that climate and environment is another similarity. People asked me before I came here, they said, you know, will you be able to survive the cold? Um, and some of those people were, were from my home area, but a lot of those um, were people that I either knew from around the world or other parts of the, the U.S. And they didn't realize I come from a pretty cold part of the U.S. too. So I've been through winters before. I've seen a lot of snow. I've, I've dealt maybe not with the sustained level uh, of cold and snow, but I, I know it and, and it's familiar to me. Um, so we, we come from colder parts of our country. We have names that maybe to the outside world uh, have a little bit of a negative So are there a large band coming? Sure, come in. Hi, 
Thank you all for arriving. That's going to look really impressive on the video that, that this whole four of the people heard me from the hall and were compelled to come in and hear this interesting talk. Um, so, so as uh, as we were saying, uh, some of the similarities between my home region and Siberia, the, the names have negative connotations sometimes to outside communities. Um, there is a, a shared coldness in the winter. Um, there is a a shared perception uh, of the places. They're also in the middle of the country, um, sort of away from the major cities and some of the major attention that the outside world gives to our countries. And in a very interesting sort of turn, in, turn of events, while our two countries were operating for um, the, the span of about 100 years on very, very different um, political and economic ideologies, we were, we were moving in very different directions in those facets, but those two systems, the system of capitalism and the system of communism, both very interesting resulted in some of the very same things. And one of those marked things was a high number of single industry towns, towns that were really built for one purpose or one industry where everything in that town was connected to um, a, a single process or building of a single product and so that was happening for very different reasons and under very different situations but the same end result occurred and um, so as I've had a chance to travel around this region a little bit uh, I've, I've seen evidence of that here just as I see that at home and I've also seen what's happened in the last 20 years or so in both countries um, maybe even longer than that maybe 30 to 40 years as those single industry towns have had to redevelop themselves and, and reimagine what they are and try to become something different as those industries either faded or changed, became automated, all the different things um, that have happened to industrial production uh, over the last few decades. So we'll talk about all those things today um, and largely I'll talk about my home region and, and when possible I'll try to make connections to uh, my experience here as well and, and give examples of, of how some of the things that I know at home might be a little bit familiar to you. So as we get started, I think one of the really important things to do uh, as we talk about the, the American Rust Belt is to define where it is. There are a lot of different maps and sort of like Siberia, another similarity, there is some argument over what's included in Siberia and what's not. There are certain cities um, that very much want to be included. There are cities that argue over who's the capital or who is the primary city of Siberia. Uh, and the same thing is true in the American Rust Belt. Um, there are a number of different maps and a number of different ideas of what it includes. Some of them really only focus on this place right here. Some of them are a little bit broader. Um, I like this map in particular because this is a map that splits the region into the connected industries that sort of caused its growth but then also caused its harm. And so what we see in upper Ohio, um, southern Michigan, northeastern Indiana, and even over into Illinois and Wisconsin, we see heavily the automotive in industry. East, uh, in eastern Ohio and West Virginia, where I've been teaching for the last few years, and in uh, Pennsylvania and New York, we have metals and metal extraction from the ground. Um, also in that same region, we have coal production. Uh, we have some of that out here as well. And then we have associated industries further to the west. And so this is a map that sort of takes into account all the, the industries that came together and collected and how those communities were connected to each other. And so um, I really like the boundaries of this map. Um, one of the things that this map does is actually um, it, it breaks off a little bit. As we see, we've got St. Louis included. Um, we've got Evansville, Indiana, which is actually um, where I'll be moving this summer. I'll be moving to Owensboro, Kentucky um, to take a new job as a professor at a new university, and it's just across the river from Evansville. Um, so this, this actually, we see Philadelphia included on this map, um, Elmira, New York, and so this, this is a map that sort of focuses on industry and not just clumping into one solid form, uh, and I think this is the most accurate. Just to give an idea of where I've spent most of my time, 
uh, in my life. I was born and raised in Cincinnati, Ohio, which is right here. Um, I went to college in northern Kentucky, northeastern Kentucky, right here. Um, I came back to southern Ohio, just a little bit east of Cincinnati and worked. I spent a couple years in Tennessee, which is off the map into the south, so I got out of the Rust Belt for just a couple of years. Um, I went to postgraduate school here in southern Illinois near um, St. Louis in a very much a, a coal extraction community, which was called Carbondale, so that gives you a little bit of an idea of what they did there. Um, so then I moved back to Cincinnati for a couple years. I moved uh, to Huntington, West Virginia for the last two years, and now I'm moving to one more yellow dot. And so um, those are the places where I've lived, and 90% of them are within this yellow zone, the American Rust Belt. Um, so this is, this is the geographical location that we're talking about today. Um, this is the upper, what we call the upper Midwest of the United States. So. Um, sort of the upper, the northern central east, maybe. It's, it's hard to define. There's so many, so many small regions uh, in the country. Um, let's move on. Here's how it got its name. The name actually has been around since 1984. Um, came from a failed presidential candidate, Walter Mondale. He's credited with coining the term the Rust Belt, and it stuck as a derogatory term for these blighted post-industrial cities. How many of you have heard of Detroit before, or heard of some of the decay in Detroit? We know about Detroit, right? Probably because you watched a movie about Eminem. Yeah, that's what I hear the most. Um, you've, you've seen Eminem's movie, and you saw how bad and how rough Detroit is. Um, we'll talk actually about Eminem's neighborhood in a couple minutes as we talk about the, the development and some of the recent things that have happened there. Um, so this was a negative term. Um, he was talking about how we have to fix the Rust Belt. It's broken. This big part of our country is broken. It's ugly. It's declining. And we have to fix it. We've got to make it better. And so in trying to do a very positive thing, he also called a whole big section of the country a very negative name that stuck as its nickname. Um, this is a, a long-standing tradition uh, in America, unfortunately, of politicians using language in a very uncareful way that comes back to harm them. Um, and we can see that in our most recent election, um, even connected to Russia. Both candidates addressed Russia. Uh, one candidate um, said that he loved Russia, and that's getting him in a little bit of trouble at home right now because it, it seems like he may have loved it a little bit too much um, in, in some of his, uh, his dealings. But particularly, um, we can think about Hillary Clinton, who said, we've got to get tough on Russia, right? Now, when she said that, she didn't necessarily mean she wanted to get tough on you guys, right? She didn't want to, to make things hard for a whole country of people. There were a handful of people that she was referring to, but she was very uncareful in her language, and instead of referring to the five or six or 12 or 15 people who were making decisions that she disagreed with, she spoke uncarefully, she spoke poorly, and made an entire nation of people angry. It's not a very smart thing to do if your job is focused, or if your job revolves around being liked and appreciated by people, right? Um, and so Walter Mondale did the same thing about our own people. He developed a, a derogatory nickname for a whole big quadrant of the country where a lot of people lived, and they didn't vote for him because he was calling their hometown and he was calling the region and the place that they loved a negative name, right? Um, so in recent years, the term has actually come to stand for resiliency of these communities, not their former hardships. So now we see we see T-shirts. We see there's a publishing company called the the Belt Publishing. Um, there there are um, uh, shops that sell Rust Belt memorabilia. There are. Um, there are different companies that, that sell all sorts of things related to the region as a, a, a term of pride. Um, is a term of, we are people who have been through hard times and we have uh, made it through. And we're, we're resilient. Uh, we're strong. And so this thing that was meant um, 20 years, 30 years ago, uh, is a very negative thing, has been sort of absorbed by the population, and we've turned it around and said, 
yeah, it, this is this is a sign of our power, of strength, that we got through the difficulties that other people caused us by their decisions, and and we made it work, and we've we've made our homes better, we've made them interesting and vibrant again. And we'll talk about that a bit more in a moment. So let's talk a little bit about what happens um, to give it the name the Rust Belt. Before Walter Mondale started talking about it, something negative needed to happen there. And so um, there was a confluence of events. Um, globalization, shifted workforces, changing corporate strategies, and depleted resources in some regions. Um, our new president likes to talk a lot about how he's going to bring the coal industry back, um, which is associated very much with the Rust Belt region. Um, there's a very, very big problem with that, which is that the coal-producing regions are more or less out of coal. So it's going to be very, very hard for him to bring back an industry that has nothing to pull out of the ground anymore. He can hire all the coal miners he wants, but if there's not anything for them to mine, there's not an industry any longer. And so um, depleted resources have, have caused some of the, the change. Um, we, we get our coal from other parts of the world now and other regions in the U.S. And so there's no need to have factories that were near the coal. And so some of these factories closed down. Um, globalization was uh, part of the equation here. Um, some of the factories and some of the things that we were producing in America, um, just we simply either didn't need or they could be produced more cheaply elsewhere. Um, factories were moved to different countries. Production was moved elsewhere. Um, one question, um, they, they sort of warned us before I came to Russia, uh, they said there's a question that's going to be a trap, right? Um, and this question was, uh, who won World War II? That sounds like an odd thing to connect to, uh, to the Rust Belt, but bear with me for a second. They said, you're going to be asked who won World War II, and if you say America, you're going to be in trouble because the Russian people are going to say, no, we've been through more hardship and we've been through, we fought longer and it affected our homeland and all of those things are absolutely true. Regardless of who actually won the war, the Americans benefited the most from it. And there's a very particular reason for that. Um, we did not enter the war until um, well into it. The war did not touch our homeland except for one island that was very removed from the main body of the country and even when that event did occur at Pearl Harbor, it was almost strictly the military that was affected. There were not civilian losses at home. Um, there was not any destruction of infrastructure. There wasn't any interruption in our production. In fact, if anything, even before we entered the war, we started to build up our industrial production, a lot of which happened in the industrial Midwest. We opened new factories and built more means of production because we were supplying the rest of the world as they were involved in a war effort. And as their people were being lost in battles, we were building things and making money. And then when we did enter the war, we had a thriving production system. We were operating at, at heavy... Um, heavy um, um, capacity and then when our men started going away to the war for the first time women were heavily brought into the induct industrial production force for the first time and so we had this entire new workforce of people women certainly worked before that but not mostly um, not within heavy industri industry and so when the war ended and Europe is destroyed, and parts of Asia are destroyed, Germany is certainly destroyed, much of Russia is destroyed, well, we're sitting there with factories that are operating at the highest output ever, our workforce is heavily trained, we've got great production, and the rest of the world needs help building things, we profited from that. Uh, for better or for worse, and, and you can argue the ethics, the morality, the, the logistics of it, and you can argue about what was good and what was bad, but that was the simple reality of it, that for nearly a century, we benefited from the end of that conflict. Um, it put us in a very, very powerful position, a very wealthy position uh, among the world. And the biggest beneficiary of that power, that wealth, that industrial capacity, was the upper Midwest. The Rust Belt was the place where all these things were being built and delivered, first in the war and then after the war, 
uh, as we uh, changed the, the styles of housing, as we started building new products, and even as our soldiers came home um, and had more money, um, had opportunities to go to college, um, because part of what was given to them for their service in the military was they were given very inexpensive opportunities to go to college, and so we were becoming more educated as a people. All of these things came together and uh, made the upper Midwest very powerful. People started buying cars, and Detroit became wealthier and wealthier as more and more cars were built there, and, and more and more people were paid well to build cars, and so they became wealthier. Eventually, though, the rest of the world got back to where it was before the war, and then exceeded that. And they had their own industry and they had their own wealth, and they had their own production, and they had their own um, style of, of producing things. And so all of a sudden this capacity that was built up in the upper Midwest was no longer needed by the rest of the world first, and so some of the factories started to close. And then we started buying things as globalization showed up. We started buying things from other places, and so we weren't even buying them from our own factories. And so more and more factories closed, and you just see this shrinking, this shriveling. That led to crime. That led to poverty. That led to problems, because you have people losing their jobs. You have a city like Detroit that was built for 5 million people, and suddenly 1 million people live there. And you have housing for 4 million people that are sitting empty. If you have an urban area, and it has vacant space within it, those vacant spaces very quickly become involved in things that are no good. Right? Vacant space within an urban area, historically, in most cultures, has led to increased crime. And so we had uh, Detroit is the most notable example of that, but through other major industrial areas all over the country, um, the cities ex expanded heavily and then contracted quickly. When they contracted quickly, there were empty spaces where crime began to take place, um, blight began to take place, you also had a phenomenon called white flight, um, where the cities became incredibly segregated. Um, white people moved out of the inner core of the cities, and African Americans largely remained because they were heaviest hit by the loss of industrial jobs, and so they couldn't necessarily afford to move elsewhere, and so that was another problem where workers had been living together and working together sort of harmoniously. Now the cities became segregated, people became distrustful of each other, people began blaming each other for their problems, and so all of these things happened out of um, the economic difficulties caused by these four key ideas. So. I mentioned earlier that a lot of the cities were built for a single industry. Um, Detroit was based on building cars, but other cities had similar, um, similar functions. In fact, let's actually look at a couple cities. We'll go back to the map for a moment. Let's look at a couple cities and what they did. We've already talked about Detroit. They assembled vehicles here. But they didn't necessarily build all the parts there. And so there were factories in Toledo where transmissions were made, the actual, you know, the transmissions and the engines that ran the car. Um, the bodies and other pieces of the car were built in Flint, Michigan, up here further to the north, and in Saginaw, Michigan. Um, rubber for tires was made heavily in Akron, Ohio, right here. Um, there were four major rubber companies that supplied at one time about 90% of the world's rubber. Um, was all created in one town. There were huge, enormous, sprawling factories, and it was all made right there because they had the resources nearby um, to create it and to use it. There was a shipping port nearby to import the things that needed to come from elsewhere. Um, you had um, other production in Fort Wayne, Indiana. In Chicago, you had a lot of food production. So Novosibirsk is sometimes called the uh, the Chicago of Siberia because the cities grew so quickly. Part of the reason that Chicago grew so quickly is that all this land further to the west, this is where our food was grown and we needed some place to bring it and gather it together to take it to global markets, to ship it to the rest of the country, to process it. Um, when, you know, when it was livestock, they needed a centralized place to, to butcher those and to prepare those. 
um, grains. They needed to put those together and ship them. And so Chicago became a center for that. And that's part of why Chicago grew so quickly. Um, and Novosibirsk grew quickly for, for other reasons, but they have that in common, that quick growth. So, so you've got Chicago is heavily um, food products. We have um, a lot of metal production in Pittsburgh because you had uh, coal mines nearby. You had the raw materials um, for iron ore nearby and, and that production. And so um, Cleveland was a banking center center of, of banking, um, center of finance, so the people that were running all these companies heavily lived in Cleveland. Um, in fact, at one point, um, Cleveland was pretty close to the size and power of New York City, um, Cleveland, Ohio, and it certainly is, has declined a little bit since then because the places that New York City was financing have continued to thrive, and the places that Cleveland was financing uh, have struggled, and so its growth stalled and slowed down. Um, it's still a city of about 3 million people, but nowhere near the size or power of New York um, at this point. And so, uh, let's see. And then down along, down along the Ohio River, there were a number of steel um, towns as well. Um, Portsmouth, Ohio is one that we'll talk about in a few minutes. Uh, Huntington, West Virginia, where I've lived the last couple years. Um, there's, a, there's a picture on the front of my webpage that, that was used as my university publicity photo and it's taken in front of a steel mill that's across the street from our university. So when I left the, the classroom of my university, there's a, a steel production plant right across the street with, with smoke coming up and um, we're all uh, breathing in things that we probably shouldn't be breathing every day. So these are examples of some of the single industry towns. So if cities originally thrived and did well under a single industry production system, why did an entire region fall apart instead of just individual cities? Well, as I've mentioned, the cities were, uh, they might have concentrated on a single production method, <coughs> but the whole region was a system of heavy industry. And all the towns were trading with each other or connected or closely knit with each other. Um, it sustained its neighbor. It was sustained by its neighbor. And so as individual industries uh, struggled, the entire region fell apart. Unemployment went up. Um, those who could leave left most quickly. And the people who left most quickly were the most talented, the most skilled, and the most wealthy people. And so they left and took their money, and they took their ingenuity, and they took their ideas and their capacity, and they left. And so that was another drain on the industry because the people that would have had the ability to, to sort of stop some of the bleeding, they were the first ones to get out. They saw the problems coming. They said, oh, I'm getting out of here before it gets worse. And they went and found somewhere better to be. And um, so that furthered the problems. Um, so that often left the least skilled and most impoverished workers behind to deal with the problems that other people created. And so that was... Um, sort of the Rust Belt at its low point. Um, we've talked about this just a moment ago. Cleveland, Ohio, banking. Huntington, West Virginia, as I mentioned, in addition to that steel mill, they also made railroad cars there. So the cars that were shipping all the things around the whole region were made in Huntington. There's an enormous empty factory on the other side of the university that's been empty for 30 years because at some point things weren't being shipped back and forth between the cities of our region anymore. They didn't need any more rail cars to be built. The factory closed, everybody lost their job, and now this big empty factory still stands there years and years later um, because nobody even has the money to demolish the factory and build something new there. Um, Central Pennsylvania oil e extraction. Um, when you think of the United States and you think of oil, you probably think of Texas or California, uh, maybe even offshore wells. Uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, but the first oil that was found in the U.S. and the first um, experiments in using oil in industrial methods uh, or even to power vehicles happened in central Pennsylvania. And so that's right in the heart of this Rust Belt area. Uh, Titusville, Pennsylvania was actually the, the site of the first oil well. Um, Ashland, Kentucky is an enormous oil refinery. Um, this is very close to where I've lived in, in Huntington, West Virginia, but they process all the oil. So the oil that comes from all the wells in Pennsylvania, uh, Kentucky, West Virginia, 
they refine it and process it there in Ashland, and that's the entire town is built around that um, production facility. Um, Charleston, West Virginia. Once the oil is refined in Ashland, they send the different byproducts, the things that the oil, the raw oil is distilled into, they send it um, by rail car that were probably made in Huntington, West Virginia. They send it by rail car to Charleston, West Virginia, and they make chemicals out of it. They make cleaning chemicals, they make agricultural chemicals, they make um, industrial chemicals, all sorts of things in different plants. Um, three years ago, there was, a, there was a leak. One of the chemical plants leaked into the river, and for more than a month, the people of the community could not drink um, municipal water. Um, very familiar to my last week when I didn't have any hot water because I live in the neighborhood, but very, very thankfully that came back last night. But this was an, an even more um, dire problem. I was very excited. My first shower without making a tea kettle bath. Uh, in a week. It was a very good day for me. Um, but uh, in, in Charleston, they, they couldn't touch the water for more than a week, or for more than a month, I'm sorry. Um, they couldn't drink it, they couldn't use it, they couldn't bathe in it, they couldn't turn it on. In fact, the, the municipal um, government actually just shut the water off altogether, and so everything that was done had to be done with bottled water. There were people that actually just, they, they got tired of it halfway through and actually sold their houses and just moved somewhere else. They said, we, we don't want to be here if this happens again. We're afraid this is going to be a regular occurrence. There are too many chemicals near too much water. We're just going somewhere else. And so this, this problem of losing people from the community um, continues. As I mentioned, uh, Pitts, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, um, the, the helmet of the football team in Pittsburgh is the, the chemical elements involved in the production of steel. So you know steel is pretty important um, to the city when even the, the football team is represented by steel. Um, which, if you're playing a sport that involves grown men lining up three meters from each other and slamming their heads into each other as hard as you can. I guess steel is a pretty good representation because there's a certain toughness you're trying to portray. Um, so I guess there are worse mascots to have. Um, Akron, Ohio, as I mentioned, rubber production. Toledo, Ohio, automotive components. Detroit was where the, the auto industry was headquartered. And so in, in addition to actually building the cars there, design and production. And so those elements. Um, Flint, Michigan also had automobile assembly. Dayton, Ohio, aircraft design and assembly. A lot of airplanes um, built and designed in Dayton. Uh, in fact, Dayton was home of the Wright brothers who, uh, who had the first manned um, flight of an aircraft and they began producing airplanes there and that industry has continued um, even though it's, it's sort of diminished in recent years and moved to other parts of the country and world. So some traits of some of these single industry towns, uh, or some traits of the Rust Belt. Um, single industry towns, purpose built for a now obsolete function. Heavy disparity between wealth and poverty. In a lot of these communities there are very, very rich people and very poor people and not much in between anymore. Um, the people in between often were, were some of the ones that, that left and stayed away. Some of the very wealthy people didn't have to leave because they were in such nice places and had such nice houses already. They were removed from all of the hardship and difficulty that other people faced. And so they didn't have to go anywhere. They sort of operated in their own small world within the city and didn't have to see other people suffer. Um, so some of them went ahead and stayed. Um, and in deep civic and regional pride. Um, there are huge athletic rivalries, something that I know is the case also here in, in Siberia after attending um, some hockey games and um, sort of interacting with, with how sports uh, is conducted here. This feels very familiar. Um, the city wants to be the best. The city wants to um, assert its dominance over other regional cities and other similar cities, and they use sports as one of the ways of doing that. Um, the, some of the rivalries get very, very heated. In fact, my hometown of Cincinnati and Pittsburgh, which I just talked about with the symbols for steel on their football helmets, um, they had a playoff game a couple years ago where I think there were seven million dollars worth of fines assessed after that game because there were so many fights and, and so much um, 
Um, there, there was actually a coach for one of the teams came onto the field and punched a player from another team in the middle of the game while the game was happening. When, when coaches are punching players, it's, something has gone really, really wrong. And a lot of this is the intensity between cities and the region. Um, our region's been through a lot and we've developed that identity of toughness. Um, but we, we interact with each other in that same way and we want to be the best. We, we want to be the place that's recognized as the, the one good place out of this difficult region. And so a lot of that takes place through sports where it's a, where it's a way that you can sort of have a rivalry and it feels, it's a lot better to say I hate Pittsburgh's football team than it is to say I hate Pittsburgh. Right? So we can sort of get away with doing it through sports and get away with feeling superior if we can blame it on being about a sports team instead of having to admit that we dislike a city of two million people for no good reason whatsoever. And that happens all over the world. I mean, watch the World Cup for a couple minutes, right? And you see the same exact thing happening. Um, we see uh, disagreements played out through sports and we see um, with, uh, a sense of national pride played out through sports and the same thing happens on a small scale um, within these communities. So um, taking advantage of low property values, this is where we start to talk about the, the good part. We start to talk about the turnaround a little bit. Um, so taking, taking advantage of low property values in depressed areas, young and ambitious groups of artisans called the maker class have in inhabited entire neighborhoods and revitalized them with fresh ideas and cultural, um, with diverse cultural product offerings. Um, I've seen a lot of this in Siberia as well. I've, I've seen a really, really resurgent and interesting maker class, people making all kinds of different things, whether it's the artisanal craft coffee that I talked about before, or craft brewing companies making um, particular types of beers, um, the, the restaurants and foods where, where people are starting unique and innovative restaurants that draw on ideas from all over the world, um, whether it be some of the crafts that are made, the, the cool um, t-shirts, and um, yesterday got to, to visit a place where, where they were selling uh, Siberian flags with, that looked like American flags with uh, snowflakes instead of stars. Um, just really, really interesting, engaging ideas um, that are unique and fresh and vibrant, driven by youthful energy and ambition. And I see this very much in Siberia and it feels like home because what has started to revitalize a lot of these cities that used to be based on heavy industry is that there's now a class of young people that instead of like their older brothers and sisters or even um, some of their relatives, uh, some of their aunts and uncles, instead of moving away and trying to say, I'm going to go find um, a life for myself in New York, or I'm going to move to Nashville, or I'm going to move to Chicago or Los Angeles, I'm going to get somewhere bigger and better and make a life. They're saying, no, I, I want to stay here and do something cool and interesting in my hometown. I want to be prideful about the place where I was raised, and I know it's been through hard times, uh, but I'm going to create something new here, and I'm going to create something uh, interesting. And so I, I want to watch a quick video, and I don't know, hopefully we have sound. We'll check uh, quickly and see. Um, but I want to watch a quick video that talks a little bit about how this happened in the city of Detroit. So we'll uh, set this up. Okay, we do have sound. Excellent. Von these nine Americans can thank Detroit for a lot. The city was the economic engine of our country and the war effort before hard times came to town. But because Detroit is good at making things, that's exactly the opportunity some new businesses see now. Our report tonight from NBC's John Yang. A ping pong table, beanbag chairs, screens full of computer code. It looks like Silicon Valley, but it's the Motor City. High-tech startups in a building as old as the Model T. Jacob Cohen helps run a venture capital firm. In the two years we've been doing it, it's been incredible. Nathan LeBan and Jay Gierak grew up in the Detroit suburbs. For independent professionals. Last fall, they moved their website, stick.com, from San Francisco, seeing better opportunities for growth. There's a ton of talent here. There's not a lot of web companies like us competing for their services. Entrepreneurs are also applying new technology to the city's mainstay industry, like the electric... 
right, so that, that's just one um, small example of what's gone on in the last few years. Um, also nearby in Detroit, there's a, there's a place that I really love um, that's called the Rust Belt Market. And um, the, the market used to be a, um, a, a production plant, a, a factory. And uh, a few years ago, it was bought by a couple of young people, and they sort of refreshed and revitalized the inside, and they sell small spaces um, to craftsmen, to photographers, to there's a, there's a bookshop in there, there's a coffee shop, uh, an or organic vegan restaurant. Um, there are, there's a, uh, a place that sells buttons that were all made from found objects uh, taken from closed down factories. Um, there are places that make maps. Um, they take old maps and make art out of them. Um, and so just a bunch of quirky, um, exciting things. The really interesting thing about the Rust Belt Market, it's in a, uh, it's in a neighborhood called Ferndale. In that neighborhood, if you walk down it, it's cupcake shops and coffee shops and uh, high-end wine shops and all of these really sort of upper-end businesses. Well, that street is the street that Eminem grew up on. And so this place that's heavily featured in the movie that shapes how a lot of the world looks at Detroit and sees it, uh, looks nothing just 10 to 15 years later. It looks absolutely nothing like uh, how it was portrayed in the movie. Uh, it's now sort of an upper middle class neighborhood. Uh, a lot of musicians live there. A lot of artists live there. Um, there. There are some friends that I've got from bands who live there and have their recording studios and things like that. It's a community that's heavily built still on making things, but not making things in huge factories that are going to destroy the city if they go out of business. It's small entrepreneurs building their own things, creating their own ideas uh, with a freshness and, and with a new energy. And that's one of the really exciting things about the Rust Belt right now. It's also one of the really cool things that I discovered uh, in this city as I moved here and got to, to interact with it. All the fresh and youthful, energetic ideas that I've seen uh, at work here. So again, as we talked about early, some similarities, uh, names with misinterpreted historical connotations, and we've already talked about that, what people think of when they, uh, in the rest of the world, when they look at Siberia. Um, but also, uh, wealth and resources have both helped and hindered the region. Um, I, I know, for example, um, there's been a debate recently in, in this region about a new uh, trash dump and, and where to place it, and I know one of the options was sort of a pristine um, forested area near a river. Um, there's, there's complexity to that issue because people make garbage and we've got to put it somewhere, but when you're surrounded by beautiful places, those decisions become even harder because you don't want to ruin something that's incredible in order to get rid of the, the mess that we've made as people. And so um, there, there are complexities involved in the resources around us and how we use them and, and how we care for them, uh, what we do when they're expended and, and when they're gone. And so that creates problems. Um, communities all over the world that have been rich in natural resources have had these kinds of problems and, and debates. The Middle East has issues with, with oil production, certainly. Uh, there's great, great wealth that comes from producing a vast amount of oil, but there are also problems with who gets that wealth and how it's used and whether it will be sustained into the future, what happens when that resource is gone. And so both of our regions, I, I think, have dealt with that issue substantially. Um, deep regional pride again. Um, I, I've, I've just met so many people that are incredibly proud of Siberia and, and I understand why uh, after the last year. And it's a beautiful place. It's a place full of energy and amazing people, of kindness, um, of beautiful natural areas and also wonderful cities. Uh, and I think the same thing is true in the Rust Belt. Um, despite the historical problems, um, there, there are beautiful parks, there are wonderful, pristine, wild areas um, that maybe aren't what you would first think of um, when you think of, of our region, um, but they're there nonetheless, and they're, they're wonderful. Um, again, we talked about some prominence of primary local industries um, in the different towns around our regions. Um, shifting demographics, uh, immigration has played a role in the development in the last few years in both regions. Um, both immigration around the country and also into and out of the country. Uh, both regions 
uh, have borders with other countries, and so there, there are questions about how people move around and how that's affecting the region in positive and negative ways uh, in both places. Um, again, natural beauty dotted by major cities. I think in the upper Midwest, uh, it's probably the part of America that's most similar to Russia in that in Russia, there are a number of very big cities with not much in between, right, in terms of developed space. There is a lot of wild, untouched, pristine land, and I think the upper Midwest is probably the most similar to that with uh, distance, and certainly that distance is on a different scale. I'm talking maybe a two or three hour drive in between major cities instead of a 14 hour uh, train ride, so it's a little bit different scale, but it's the same general idea. We have very large cities dotted by natural beauty in between. Um, Youth-driven renaissance, and we just talked about that a moment, and uh, tourism for a blend of negative and positive reasons. Um, you'll see in a, a moment um, some photos that I took when, uh, when working on a story about tourism of um, it, the, the article was called The Industry of Decay, where people go to the Midwest to take pictures of broken down buildings. And you see tourists that come here as well to take um, pictures or to look at the remnants of either the Soviet Union or to look at things that are um, you know, um, broken down and things like that. You, you have people that travel here to do that. We have that as well. In the, in the Midwest, but you also have tourists that come for the, the beautiful um, natural scenery that come just to explore the city and meet people. And so we have a blend of positive and negative um, tourism um, in both of our regions. So a couple of photos, and I'll run through these. Um, this is, I love this photo because of the lines, um, personally, the, the different directions that everything's going. But this is actually taken from my home state of Ohio, looking across the Ohio River um, toward West Virginia. And some of the things that we see here, there's a lot going on in this picture. It, it's probably not the most beautiful picture to you, but I love it because so much is happening. Um, right here we have a major highway. We've got the sign for a major highway. On the other side of the major highway is a railroad line, um, a very busy um, railroad line. And then we've got a river with the bridge. Um, we have a mountain that comes up from here. On the other side, we have both a um, coal-driven power plant. There's a steel mill right here. And there is a, um, a natural gas production facility right here. So you've got three very huge plants operating. A river, a rail line, a road, a major bridge, all these things connected and so compact. And I, I think this picture says a lot about the tightly knit um, connection of the area. We talked a little bit before about cities uh, falling apart when one industry went out. And so I'll, I'll tell a, a quick story. Um, about a city that I've written about and spent time in, Portsmouth, Ohio. So Portsmouth, Ohio, just as an example of what happened to a lot of the cities within this region, <coughs> Portsmouth, Ohio was a city built around a steel plant. It was, the, so the steel mill was five miles, so that would be about, maybe what, eight kilometers, eight, nine kilometers long. Um, the, the plant itself. It was an enormous facility. Uh, it stretched along the banks of the Ohio River. Um, it, was, it was very, um, I think 80% of the people in the, the city worked at that plant in some capacity, whether they were actually working as steel producers or security guards or um, in the cafeteria making food. But then if you think about the rest of the community, all the things that happened about it, or around it. There were, there were two major railroad companies that had rail yards there because of all of the coal that needed to be brought in, all of the raw natural materials that needed to be brought in, and so they had large rail yards. Um, so two major railway companies operated yards there and employed people. There was a thriving river port where more resources were brought in or taken out um, once the, the steel was produced. Right across the street from the steel mill, there was a row of restaurants and shops where the workers could just walk right across the street and get lunch. Um, and so all of, these, all of these places were open right across the street from it. Um, the housing basically was a big circle that radiated out from the steel mill. So everything was 
The whole town itself looked like an amphitheater pointed right at the steel mill. Um, everything was connected. So the steel mill was sold a couple times to other companies, but nobody really thought anything of it. As long as it was still producing, it, it, was, it was fine, and everybody still had their job, and everybody did their work. Um, but one morning, the, uh, the workers, uh, after, after the uh, overnight shift, um, there were security guards hired, and, and even some National Guardsmen were brought in with, with weapons, unfortunately, and um, they locked the gates to the plant. And in between the third shift and the first shift of the next day, um, they basically um, locked all the gates and said, the plant's closed, we're not making anything else. Uh, and it was locked down overnight. So not only did that plant close, and that means 80% of the town's people are, are out of work immediately, right? So their jobs are gone, they have, they have nothing to do now. But now those people have no money to spend at the restaurants across the street. The two rail yards and the river port have no purpose to be there. There was another smaller plant a little bit down the road that actually built things out of the steel components that were made in that plant. Well, now that place didn't have anywhere to get their materials anymore, and so they went out of business. And within less than two months' time, 90, 90 to 95% of the people in that community had lost their jobs. The teachers at the schools, as people started to move away, there was less need for teachers at schools because there weren't as many students anymore. People were leaving. People were packing up and moving out. They didn't need as many firemen. They didn't need as many police officers. There was an entire water company that did nothing but provide water for that plant. That was closed, right? And so everything, everything was connected. The, the sewer department, there wasn't as much sewer anymore. People didn't live there. so. Uh, everything contracted and within just a couple of months the city went from a population of over 100,000 people to less than 20,000 people in less than six months and then again what I said about the empty spaces within an urban area now you get other people coming in and breaking out a window and saying I'm gonna live in this place that's empty nobody cares nobody's gonna pay attention and then you get um, drug abuse when depression begins to set in alcohol abuse and all sorts of other problems that go along with it and um, the city essentially fell apart uh, to this day I drive through it um, there have been some uh, some changes and some new industries have come but um, for the most part it's still just a, a big empty bunch of buildings along the river um, all those people went somewhere else uh, and um, that, that happened all over the region on different scales and at different levels. Sometimes it didn't affect 90% of the community, it just affected 60%. But that's still a lot of people, and that's still a lot of pain. So this picture is actually taken very close to Portsmouth. Um, this is, um, I, I think this one's very interesting. This is actually in Detroit, and if you look at the sign at the bottom, it says you're entering a foreign trade zone. If you look closely at the building, it's locked up, all the windows are broken out and busted, so there's not very much foreign trade that's happening here. So I, I think there's, there's a, a lot of uh, symbolism in that particular photo. There is, um, let's see, this is nearby, this is also in Detroit. This used to be an automotive plant, um, they made cars in here. It's been empty now for about 30 years, and um, there are actually a couple videos that were taken in here of skateboarders uh, doing tricks. They broke in and, and took um, a couple of really famous uh, videos. Um, but other than that, that's really about the only thing that's happening in here um, anymore. Um, this is actually a, a picture that I took of a church. This was a church in Detroit. And with some of the hardship that, that is still taking place in some of the communities there, there are some places like Ferndale that have grown and, and rebounded and revitalized. Um, but there are other communities that are still really hurting. Uh, and this church, um, with the, the broken glass on the floor here, um, this had been closed less than a week when I went into it. And within less than a week, um, we identified places where at least five different people um, had been sleeping. They had, they had gone into the church to seek shelter. Um, and actually, at, the, at that point in time, this was the middle of winter, it was about negative 35 degrees at this point. So it's very cold, um, at the dead of winter. Uh, in fact, my car almost didn't start to, uh, to get to the photo shoot. Um, but within one week, all the copper wires had been stolen from the church. 
um, a, a lot of the, 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 somebody had taken the metal from the pipe organ and stolen that to go sell it for, for cash to, to make money to, to eat or um, to buy something else. And so it, it took really only a couple days for this building to be empty um, that people broke in and basically stole anything of value, uh, and that's even a church. This is right down the street from that church. This is a school. Um, the same thing had happened. You see you know, all the lockers are open where people have gone through to see if the students left anything behind. They were going to take anything of value, anything that could be sold or um, anything they could gather money from. And this is another hallway in that same school. Um, we see some, some icicles formed at the, the roof. Um, the roof has started to, to cave away. The building has, has just fallen beyond repair. But now it's going to sit there as a, a blighted, broken down building because not only does it not have structural integrity left where somebody could do something with it now, but it's also going to be so expensive to tear down that, that no one's going to want to buy the property and go through the trouble of, of breaking the building down. And so now we just have this empty building that's standing there in the middle of the town, um, lending itself to um, crime happening there, or just uh, on another level, simply looking ugly and bringing down the property values of the places around it. So a lot of problems going along with um, just the, the simple idea that the schools are going out of business, right? That's a problem. Um, this is the main train station in Detroit, and this is very much a symbol of the community. Um, what I really love in this video, or this uh, photo, you can see, uh, if you look at it closely, there are two windows that haven't been broken out, right here and right here. Uh, everything else has been broken out and destroyed. The, uh, the building's been empty for years. Different developers have bought it. Someone tried to make it into a shopping mall. Somebody else tried to turn it into a hotel. Um, it was a very grand building at one point. Um, but now, again, this is, this is sort of the essential problem of Detroit. The thing became useless, but now what do you do with it? It's standing there. It's going to cost a fortune to, to tear it down and try to turn it into something else. And so it just sits there unused, um, like so much of the city. Uh, this, is, uh, this is President Obama in my hometown um, talking about one of the huge problems that the Midwest faces, which is infrastructure. Um, our infrastructure, in addition to these buildings and places that have gone, gone out of business, if you're trying to rebuild a, an area and rebuild a region, you need strong infrastructure to, to get people there and get people out of there, to get materials in and out for, for producing things and for selling them for commerce. And this bridge right behind him um, is carrying about 85% um, more traffic than it was designed for and it has already existed 20 years past the span that it was designed to last and so it is it's one of the most dangerous bridges in the US um, it's needed replaced for over 10 years and it connects two states and so those states keep arguing over whose responsibility is to replace it and uh, I know you guys have had some debate about bridges here as well, so this is probably a, a familiar issue. Um, but it, it connects these two different regions and nobody can agree what to do. Um, Kentucky, the state to the south, wants to, they say, well, we'll build the new bridge, but we're going to charge tolls of every car that passes by it and we get to keep the profit from the tolls forever if we build the bridge. And Ohio is saying, no, this is a, a public service. This is to build the community. If you charge a toll to people that are using it, it's going to defeat the purpose of building the thing to begin with. And so they're, they're just at odds over the function and, and what infrastructure should be and what it means. And then the federal government is just kind of standing there saying, well, you know, we don't have money for that. Right? So it's, uh, it's just been, it's been a big problem. And President Obama very, very much um, wanted to get it fixed. And at the time, the, uh, the Republican Party was controlling the, the House and the Senate. And they said, no, we don't have money to spend on that stuff. And now there's a Republican president. And he says, we have to fix all the infrastructure. And the Democrats in the House and Senate are saying, we don't have money for that stuff. And so they just keep trading arguments every few years. And they keep switching sides of the issue so that nobody ever agrees enough to get the things done that need to get done. And I know you would never have um, political problems like that here in Russia, but <laughs> we, uh, we do. Um, so 
I, I think that's something that's similar to we get political frustration of people promising things that, that turn out never to happen. And so I, I think that's one other way in which we can feel just a little bit familiar. So um, I think that is, yeah, that's all I've got. So here's some, some contact information. Um, my blog is Dispatches from Siberia, and also the, the notes and the photos from this presentation are available online on that website as well, if you'd like to look at these again. Um, but what I'd love right now is to know if you guys have any questions for me, and it can be about um, my time here in Siberia, it can be about the um, upper Midwest, or it could be about anything in general. So I'd love to, to hear your questions. Interesting question because one of the one of the tenets to this area is that there have been a lot of great writers that have come from the Midwest, but not many of them have written about the Midwest. Um, they've written about other places in the country, or they've done what I talked about, and they left the region and went somewhere else, and then wrote about that place later um, in their career. And so this is actually something that I talk to uh, my students in my creative writing class here. Uh, in Russia about because I noticed when they started writing at first, they're writing in English language, and so my students start writing stories set in England and set in America. And while it's really interesting to imagine what a Russian person feels might be happening in England or, or America, most of the students had never been there before. They just felt like, well, I'm writing in the language of England or America, so I should write about that place. The rest of the world wants to know what's happening in Russia and what Russian people feel about the world and how you guys go about here every day. Like we, we want to know in English what Russia is like to Russians. Um, I think the rest of the country wants to know what the Rust Belt is like to Americans. And so I've very much been engaged in trying to write about the region. I think the best place to go right now is a really cool journal. Um, so not a book, but a journal. It's called Midwestern Gothic. And you can actually buy copies of it for $1 a piece, or about 60 rubles uh, online. Uh, if you have an iPhone, um, or if you download the, the iBook app, I think you can also get them on Amazon uh, and on Kindle. Um, but Midwestern Gothic, it, it's not only Gothic type stories, that's just the name that they, they gave to their publication. Um, but it publishes only writers with a connection to the Rust, Rust Belt region and very much tells the stories of that region and so it's sort of it's the same idea as a lot of those small stores and small shops that are being developed these are brand new writers who maybe have one book out or don't have any books out yet but they're writing stories and they're thinking about this region um, it, it publishes poetry nonfiction, and fiction and so i think midwestern gothic is probably the best place to go for contemporary writing uh, about the Midwest. Now if you go back to, um, you can go back to older works and you can find things like um, Upton Sinclair and you can find some things about the, the industrial um, cities, but I think in terms of contemporary work, I, I would look at journals um, very much and let me think. I think the Indianola Review also is an online journal that, that does the same thing. Um, but, but Midwestern Gothic, I think, has a little higher level of quality um, and a really good editorial staff that cares about um, the region very much. Um, there's also um, Belt Publications is um, putting together anthologies, actually, about all the cities in, um, in the Rust Belt region, and they're doing a really awesome job. Um, curating these. So, for example, the anthology that they put together for Cincinnati uh, included uh, a short story by the mayor. Um, there was an essay from a professional baseball player. There was a, an essay by uh, the lead singer of the band The National, which has become a, a well-known um, band that tours all over the world now. And he grew up in Cincinnati and then left, so he wrote about what it's like to leave. And then there's another singer who moved to the city from someplace else, and so uh, those two stories go back to back, and and so they they just they've curated and picked some really interesting people from the cities, not just professional writers, but just interesting people to sort of tell their stories about what the city is like and what it's meant to them. And there's a uh, there's an anthology for Cleveland, for Pittsburgh, for Toledo, um, Youngstown, Ohio now uh, has one. Youngstown, Ohio was. Um, 
it, it was another auto production site and it actually got so corrupt in the um, in the 1970s that the city was basically run by the Italian mafia um, it, seriously and it got to a point there were two used car sales lots in the city and basically the way to tell if your loved one had been killed by the mob was to drive by the used car lot and if you saw your car there you knew that your husband wasn't coming home because they would they would kill people and then put their car up for sale at this auto lot and you you would learn that somebody was yeah yeah it, it was an intense place it, it's it's changed a lot since then it's got a very good university there um, the, the car lots are a little bit calmer now um, but there were there were some crazy things happening um, in Youngstown. Youngstown also, um, coincidentally, uh, for a long time, had a very, um, very heavy population of Russian and Ukrainian people. <laughs> they, I think they largely left when the, uh, the Italian mob took over. Uh, they were smart enough to get out uh, after that happened. So, um, and there are actually there are several Orthodox um, churches there as well. So that was really the first place that I saw like the big golden onion domed um, churches in the U.S. Um, so good question. Other questions? I can I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, have you set any of your stories in the Midwest, and are you planning to set any of your stories in Siberia? Absolutely. Um, <laughs> yes on both. And so um, I've actually I've had one story in, um, in the Midwestern Gothic Journal, and that's part of how I became familiar with that. Um, but I've written a story um, set in Portsmouth. Um, um, and, and actually the, the surrounding city, the nearby city, which is called New Boston, I actually got to read that on campus um, a couple months ago. Um, the story that I'll read tonight at the research library um, downtown um, is also set in, in eastern Ohio. It's, um, the, that story is about a, um, um, a chaplain at a home for war veterans who um, is, is sort of aging and feeling his mortality as he, he takes care of these heroes, but he's sort of struggling with his own legacy. Um, and he's from that region as well, so he's faced some of the problems um, that that region has. Uh, as a matter of fact, I have an entire book um, of stories from, from the Midwest that is um, it's in the process of being edited for a publisher right now. Um, and um, actually, Several of those stories are included in a reader that we've put together that, that will be used on, on campus here. And so those will be available for students to, to use as a learning tool um, after I've left. Um, in terms of Siberia, I've actually, um, my idea when I came here was to write a, a book um, about something that, that I discovered and learned about here. Uh, and I actually had too many ideas. And so I'm, I'm writing two books that are largely set in Siberia. Some of the stories take places in other, part of Russia, or other parts of Russia, but they're mostly set in um, Siberia. And one of the books is just about Siberian stories, and the other one is about Russians who have interactions with people from the West um, within the story. And so there's some kind of um, Russian-Western interaction that happens in that story that either leads to or solves the, the main problem of the story. Um, and then I'm actually working on the, the talk that I just gave today, um, a more detailed version of this discussion. Um, when I was asked to give this talk originally at the, the library, uh, I started researching and thinking about it, and this is just sort of the outline of, of what's become a book, um, comparing very specific cities. And so I talked very generally today, um, but I've also started looking at city to city comparisons and looking, okay, this city in Siberia is very similar to this American city and here's why. And, and this city's history is similar to this city and this city's present is similar to this other city. And so, um, so I'm, I'm working on a nonfiction book um, about what we talked about today, but on a much more specific um, basis. So yeah, a lot, <laughs> a lot of, Great. a lot of Midwest and a lot of Siberian writing happening. So, mm -hmm. so uh, what uh, cities have you visited besides Novosibirsk? Mm -hmm. So I have been to Irkutsk, um, Krasnyarsk, um, Nizhny Novgorod, um, Ekaterinburg, um, Kazan. 
which is, in, I know, not in Siberia. And some of the, in, in the book, I've, I've expanded a little beyond Siberia, um, but just more looked at kind of the central sections of the country. And I also kind of got out of the Rust Belt and looked at the Midwest in general. Um, let's see, um, Volgograd, um, Tomsk, Barnaul, um, have I done anywhere else? Moscow and St. Petersburg. She has to give me permission when I go, so I'm <laughs> checking with my <laughs> my uh, my scorekeeper um, on all my trips. But I, I think that's mostly been. They called me count as a separate. Yeah, yeah. So and and actually, I've written about that separately because I think some of the this this is something else that's really interesting because along the Great Lakes, um, there are a lot of small little tourist towns where. Before flights were readily available, all the people from those big factory cities would go on their vacations to these small little tourist communities along along the lake, and there would be a small beach there, and there would be some shops and some cafes, and now nobody goes there anymore, and so all these places have become worn down too, and so it's, it's harmed those cities too that had nothing to do with industry ever, but they got most of their income through people visiting in the summer, and now nobody visits anymore because it costs the same amount to, to take a, a cheap flight to the Caribbean or to Florida or um, to Mississippi's Gulf Shore or something like that. So, so these places have become obsolete. and um, I think that's a shame. That's where I went as, as a child. You know, my parents took me to these um, small lakeside towns. Um, and so, so I've, I've made some of those comparisons as well. So the Rust Belt is uh, near the Great Lakes, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah. So, so very much. It kind of radiates out in an arc from the Great Lakes. There, there's also some argument amongst scholars if the Rust Belt is strictly an American phenomenon, or if it actually stretches into Canada as well and includes Toronto, um, includes cities like Hamilton, Ontario, or Sarnia, Ontario, um, and so because. A lot of those, uh, there was a lot of trade going back and forth between the two countries and a lot of industry based right along the lakes at, at points where crossings were made or bridges. So there, there's debate over whether this was an American thing or it was a North American thing. So, um, and different scholars and academics have different opinions on that. Uh, I, I tend to feel that it was more of a North American thing. I, I would include Canada, but, um, um, you know, I, some Canadians really want to include themselves because they, they kind of look at it and say, hey, we're all in this together. And some Canadians are like, hey, that was your problem. Man. We don't want to be associated with Detroit, right? Um, when actually, it's, it's sort of funny, like um, Windsor, Ontario is right across from Detroit. And it was, when Detroit was thriving, it was sort of the place where everybody went to misbehave. They would actually go over to Canada to go to the casinos and go to the um, other associated businesses that might be near casinos. So, um, which, and, and it was also, the drinking age in the U.S. is 21, the drinking age in um, um, Canada is 18, and so my friends in high school would get in a car and drive five hours to go to a bar in Canada because they thought it was cool to be allowed into a bar, and I'm sitting there like, you guys are idiots, you guys are idiots, this is really dumb. Um, so I, I did not participate in any of those trips, but uh, and they always got a speeding ticket on the way too because they they were trying to get there faster and always got in trouble. So, but they they always had interesting stories to tell when they got back. So I guess there is that. Um, <laughs> so anybody else? Any questions? And it can be about anything in general. It it can be about I don't know, trees. I like I like birch trees. I'm gonna miss those when I go home. <laughs> also, I really like the um, the black birch trees, especially. I saw a lot of those in um, Akadem Gorodok, and found I found a nursery in the U.S. that sells them. And when I buy a home in my new city, I'm going to plant some black birch trees and think about Russia. It's gonna be really <laughs> great. And the neighbors are gonna be looking like, what kind of crazy tree is in your yard? What is going on? And I'll get to tell them all about Siberia. So I'm really That's proud and excited. Siberian flag on the wall. Yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> um, so what is your first impression of from Siberia, from North Siberia? 
first or final? Huh? First or final? First. First. Well, let's see. My, my first impression, um, I think, you know, it actually felt very familiar to me from the very first trip in. And, and so when we came in from the airport at first, the airport is out in the middle of nowhere, right? <laughs> completely inaccessible. The, the train line doesn't go there. The metro doesn't go there. There's one really slow bus that stops at random places to pick up people pushing carts along the side of the road, right? Just, you know, it's just out there. Uh, but then as you get closer, then you get sort of the expo center, and then you get, you start to see a couple of factories, and then you see kind of the town off in the distance. And, and that feels really familiar. I, I told you before that, um, you know, there, there's this similarity with a lot of wide open space and then immediately there's a big city. And, and that's really how I felt coming in from the airport, you know, and even looking down before I got here, coming in from Moscow, uh, there's nothing, there's nothing, there's nothing. And then, oh my God, there's a lot of buildings, <laughs> right? This is a big place. So, um, yeah, that, that felt very familiar, the, the very centralized sort of, there are very specific rungs of the city center, and then the first ring of neighborhoods, and then a little bit of commerce and industry, and then some more neighborhoods, and then sort of the bigger outlying you know, sports arenas or expo centers or things like that. So that just the construction of the city itself felt really familiar. And also, I've lived, uh, you, you saw on the map, I've, I've lived mostly along the Ohio River most of my life, and I really like... Um, one of my collections of stories is called Freshwater People um, because I think freshwater people and saltwater people have very different personalities. The people on the coasts of the country uh, or even on the edges of it or in the main cities have a very different outset and, and mindset than the people from that sort of interior space. And I'm very much an interior space person. I'm a river person. I'm not an ocean person. And so friends of mine like to go to the beach. I'm happier on a river. I like to see that motion. The motion of something constantly moving past me, um, I think there's an energy to that. I, the ocean to me, and I, I know there's, there's hydraulic movement within the ocean, but to me it just looks like this big static thing. Uh, and a river to me feels like constant motion, so I love being in a river city. I, I think, and I, I think this might be the weirdest thing, um, but I made sure when I was given a list of cities to select for, for my, my grant, I actually like eliminated the cities that weren't on a river. You know, I, I wanted to, that's comforting to me, that's, that's familiar to me. And, and so, so that, that was a, a first impression too, to just kind of cross that river and feel home. Probably we need to finish if we want to be on time for a second. Yes, <laughs> so I have another one today. So if anyone would like to come to the library and hear me talk more, uh, you're welcome to. So thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you very much for coming today. Maybe we could take a picture, right? Could you sure. move farther in the